Welcome to Digication Scholars Conversations. I'm your host, Kelly Driscoll. In this episode, you'll hear part two of my conversation with Gina Woodall, teaching professor in the School of Politics and Global Studies at Arizona State University, where she is also director for the Capital Scholars Internship Program, the lead faculty for the Early Start Program, and the director of community engagement. More links and information about today's conversation can be found on Digication's Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Full episodes of Digication Scholars Conversations can be found on YouTube or your favorite podcast app. How many students are you um, working with through those internship courses at a particular time? Do they span multiple semesters? They do. They... So, so Capital Scholars is just in the summer, and that's generally anywhere from 12 to 18. The past couple of years coming out of the pandemic, we've only had 12. Um, mm-hmm. But that's full time in DC. I, I go to DC for a couple of weeks out of that mm-hmm. time, but they're there all summer. Um, then during the fall and spring semester, and then also summer for the other internships, it, it de- <laughs> depends on if it's a if it's a election year. Yeah. So when there's an election year and during the campaign season, our numbers go up. Yeah. Because you have all the campaigns that are wanting interns. So I could have right. up to 40, 45 interns in a semester. Um, other semesters, it could be as, as few as 15 mm-hmm. students mm-hmm. a semester. So it really, really varies. I think in the spring, this past spring, I had 30 or 32 starting to ramp up. Mm-hmm. Um this fall, I, I expect to have about that many, and yeah. then I, I expect it to increase maybe to 40, 45 in the spring. Yeah. So in the summer, it's it's fewer. I think I have like 10 doing kind of ad hoc things this summer. That just ended. I actually have to wrap up grades <laughs> like today. Oh, well, that's yeah. a wonderful segue to my next question. Yeah. Because sometimes... Um, conversations that come up around this kind of e-portfolio work do center on, you know, are the e-portfolios something that's um, kind of embedded in a particular course or across a program? Is it going to be required? Is it going to be optional for the students? Um, Do we want to, you know, how are we going to assess them? Um, yeah. Are they going to be graded or is it yeah. something that's going to be more learning outcomes based um, kinds of assessment? So I was curious how you uh, approach that as well. Yeah, you know, I, I do grade them. They are worth points. I, I, I find in, you know, in my almost 20 years of teaching now, um, if you don't put a grade on it, they they just, they don't value it as much. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, I, I hate to say it, but that's just real. That's the system that we created. Mm-hmm, and so that's mm-hmm. the system that the students play. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I do put points to each component. So generally what I do is, again, I want it to be in kind of a, a iterative process where, you know, they, I want them to, to complete a, a couple um, tabs So, Mm -hmm. you know, a bio page and then a resume, it's super easy, right? They upload a resume, they have a bio page, put up some pictures. So that'll be worth, you know, 40 points or something. And then they have to add like two more tabs and then two more and then like do a holistic grade at the end. And I give them feedback throughout. So after Mm -hmm. I, I do give them feedback like this doesn't look good at all <laughs> or you barely did anything you need to add this yeah. um and I do I let them I, in in for students there are some students that are really um hyper focused on grades and and, mm-hmm. and that type of thing so if they're like oh my gosh if I give them like a 10 out of 20 because they didn't do a good job they'll be like can I, can I redo it and, and yeah. get more points and for this class I always say yes it's like, yeah, you can, you know, have it done by this state and then you can make up the points because this is just a different type of class, the internship mm-hmm. class, right? It's mm-hmm. not, it's not like fake news. It's not like 110. So I say, yeah, you, you can do that. So often they will, you know, they'll then fix it and then I'll upgrade their grade. Um, and then again, you know, just kind of going through the process, they should have four tabs done by this state, six tabs done by this state, and then kind of do a final run through and I give them some points for that. So I do break it up 
throughout the semester. So they're not, and this is what I'm doing, what I learned in Capital Scholars. For Cap Scholars, I thought, well, they're, you know, they're kind of really mature and mainly seniors. And I'll just, I won't, I won't assign points to the checkpoints. I'll just check them. And I put mm-hmm. in the syllabus. I don't know what I was thinking. I, I should know students <laughs> by now. So when I went to check, nobody did anything. And I'm like, I have nothing to check. Nobody did. They're like, oh, sorry. You know, same, same old, same old. So yeah. kind of learned my lesson. I'm not going to do that next year for CAP scholars. I'm going to move, I'm going to put points to it. Mm-hmm. So I do recommend if, if you're, even if you're going to do a check, you can make it low stakes, but just put points to that check. Yeah. Um, at least at a big state university, that's kind of, you know, <laughs> they're not but doing it. If there aren't built points. in accountability and <laughs> expectations. Yes. Right. Yeah. yeah. And it does sound like the way that it's kind of, um, you know, as they're going through each of these different sections or, or tabs that you describe that they're, they are kind of designed so that they're completing them in some kind of sequential manner. Yes. And that you have these kind of built in checkpoints. Are, is it happening weekly or every few weeks? How do you every do few time? weeks? Every yeah. few weeks I is when I do it. So, you know, the first part of the semester I give every because people also with internships, a lot of students, the calendar year doesn't doesn't run smoothly with when students get internships and, right, and such. Yeah. So I'm adding students late, even like a month into the class. I'm allowed yeah. to do that. Mm-hmm. So I think I usually wait like three or four weeks before the first couple tabs are due. And mm-hmm. I put that on the syllabus and, you know, then another three weeks and another three weeks. So I do space it out. Yeah. Yeah. And do you format it, you know, out of curiosity within Digication, do you set those areas up kind of as their own assignments or do you have just kind of a running total? I, I do it as their own assignment overall. I do it as their own assignment. So within mm-hmm. Canvas, uh, mm-hmm. so we use Canvas as our um, learning platform. Um, and I'll just make, I'll, it'll be, um, you know, digication assignment number one, digication assignment number two, so on and so forth. And so then I'll have the digications open and my grade book open. And then I mm-hmm. could just see, you know, and then I could comment in Canvas or I could comment on the digication. I've been doing mm-hmm. it on Canvas lately mm-hmm. um, where, you know, they need to, they need to make this change or if they didn't do it at all, whatever. Mm-hmm. I just make comments to them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Good. Yeah. That's helpful. I know, you know, as, um, both kind of long-term e-portfolio practitioners and those that are new to this type of technology, there's a lot of kind of decision-making about how you would like to scaffold the e-portfolio experience so that, you know, you're getting the, you know, the, kind of pulling the information out from your students that you feel like would be most beneficial and valuable to them. Yeah. So there's some thinking about, you know, how how structured or open do I want to make it? How often should I be providing the students with feedback? And, you know, how will it be graded? Um, so thank you for sharing that because I know it's some kind of in the weeds kind of nuances to this, but it really can determine how um, success, kind of successful the e-portfolios will be, the resulting yeah. works that the students are creating. And um, I think when instructors are spending this kind of time exploring the different options and even learning, oh, okay, well, when I didn't have points for the different areas, this is what happened. So now I'm going to <laughs> kind of revert back what I was doing before. It's all, right. all part of the learning experience. And all of this also kind of informs um, everyone at Digication as we're making modifications and changes to the tools as well. And I, it sounds like you were probably using Digication in one of the earlier versions that rolled out at ASU and then um, kind of went through some of the, the upgrades that happened. Mm-hmm. and. You probably saw that a lot of those kinds of upgrades were in response to things that people like yourselves and your students were 
we're looking for and we're always um, very mindful in planning our development around those kinds of needs. So I appreciate you sharing that. Um, I was curious. So one of the things that I love about the organization that the students typically have in their internship uh, portfolios is there's this kind of area at the top where they're pulling out specific skills that they've developed. And it looks like they're doing that for each of the individual sections. I think I've even seen it on their contact pages. And I was curious as you guys are kind of setting the stage for how they're going to be using it, what the conversation is around that area, because it is somewhat unique to uh, the portfolios that are being created at ASU. And I was curious how that kind of came about and how students are introduced to it. Yeah, so so you're referring to just when they're um, discussing the skills that they've learned. Yeah, in the and they often ha- they have this kind of area where they're highlighting them right at mm-hmm. the top of yeah. each of the pages. So yeah. as a viewer, you, you kind of get a taste for what they're going to be introduced to as you read the actual content, which I thought was just really smart. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I do too. And I think that, um, it is something that again, from a liberal arts and sciences background, um, again, you're not, you know, you're, you're graduating with a degree in political science. It's not supply chain management or, Mm -hmm. you know, information technology. So we really, really push on, you know, skills, critical thinking skills, um, writing for, you know, uh, you know, policy analysis, mm-hmm. um, uh, like I said, critical thinking, um, uh, professional, you know, writing, uh, in, in the political world, which is different. Mm-hmm. So when you have yeah. to write kind of a, a white paper or a, a certain, uh, you know, research paper for an elected official who has very limited time and they have to digest something and they have two two and a half minutes to read it and understand it, you better be very concise in your work. And so being able to put that skill, you know, writing, writing in this style, you know, writing um, for, um, you know, policy prep, whatever, uh, that that's a skill that you definitely want to highlight at the top, because that's something that, yeah, a viewer could look at and go, huh, that's a skill. And then there is an example of that paper, right? Yeah. There is an, is an example of that. And so I think that that's really critical. Also, um, in, in liberal arts and in our degree, I mean, we do um, highlight, you know, the, the ability to, to kind of talk on your feet. And to be able to be concise mm-hmm. and to be able to communicate, communication is really, really crucial and important and not a skill that I think is well developed in, in all other disciplines and majors. Yeah. So that is something that we do highlight. And so we say that's something that, that, you, that you learned on the job that, you know, you're communicating with other interns, you're communicating with your supervisor, you're communicating with elected officials, you're communicating with lobbyists. And so being able to highlight that, and then also if you can showcase, you know, did you have to give a short speech? Mm -hmm. You know, how did you communicate with, um, you know, with uh, lobbyists or whatever? Mm -hmm. Do you have any examples of that? Um, And so that verbal communication is also, I think, really important that that could be highlighted as well. And then, of course, the technology skills. So obviously we live in a world of big data political science students also have to, much to their chagrin, they have to, uh, <laughs> not always their favorite <laughs> and understand and be able to manipulate numbers and yep. you know, be able to work in these different programs like R and, and Stata. Mm-hmm. And, and if you're a dinosaur, like I am SPSS and other web-based <laughs> programs. So, um, you know, being able to, to then you know, highlight that skill you know, that mm-hmm. you are proficient in this and then to be able to show what, what maybe data analysis you did, you know, what mm-hmm. is an example, what have you completed? Um, that's really, really important. And so, yeah, I think that really highlighting those skills right off the bat, you know, I could think on my, think and speak on my feet. Um, I can write efficiently and cogently, and then I could also analyze data. And here are three examples of, of me doing that. I think is really important. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I wanted to pull up, I was going to look at um, one of the 
students portfolios that um I'm aware it was a student that was under your wing and they have an area within their portfolio that's, um, you know, kind of highlighted as skills and, and competencies. Do they choose what's listed under that main kind of section? Yes. I don't. So they, they have some flexibility there because I know that there's some programs that are very, um, kind of professional practice standards oriented where, um, you know, what's kind of listed out there can be more rigid. So I was kind of curious if that was something that was already built out that they were filling in or if they were making some choices about what, what's shown there. No, I, I am very um, flexible and I kind of see this also as a creative endeavor and Mm -hmm. I have students that are, we have a very wide variance of students and interests and, and, and everything. I mean, just students kind of doing very different things mm-hmm. under the umbrella of political science. Right. So I allow them to make that, those decisions. And they generally do on their own. You know, they'll, again, I'll say, think about, mm-hmm. you know, what are the skills? What are the competencies you've learned? If you don't know, we could get on a call and we could kind of brainstorm if you're unsure, I said, talk to your colleagues, talk to your peers, talk to your supervisor. If again, if you need, you know, some assistance, but most of the time, I think if they just, again, take the, you know, 30 minutes, take a day to kind of reflect and think about and jot down, well, this is something that I've done. Take a step back, think about it, go back to it. You know, are, are there any examples of, of that skill that you've, um, that you've become kind of efficient and competent at. Um, so I give them the flexibility to do that on, on their own. Yeah. To, to, to fill in, you know, what those are. Yeah. Cause I'm finding they're very interesting kind of skills that they're highlighting that you wouldn't often see in, um, kind of the traditional general education outcomes right. or like the things right. that they're choosing have very, I can see how it has this direct connection to going through and reviewing the kind of material that they created and then thinking about the wording and the organization that's in the mm-hmm. portfolio. Sometimes we see the reverse. So right. that's really interesting. I, the yeah. one that I'm looking at right now for skills and competencies, for example, has appropriations flexibility, critical analysis, and advocacy. So we might see critical analysis or critical thinking pop up quite often Mm -hmm. as um, kind of a competency or outcome, but appropriations and flexibility and advocacy, not so much. So it's really great to see that. And then I know in reading these that when you select one of those and then see the actual document or presentation that they included and the kind of reflection that they've shared around it, that those stories and the actual examples that they're sharing make a lot of sense with what they've chosen there. I know that often in the student experience, um, when, you know, institutions might be talking largely about competencies and outcomes that students are kind of trying to maybe wedge what they've done into those boxes when they may feel like they've done something that's just as valuable, but doesn't have that kind of wording associated with it. So I love that you've given students the opportunity to kind of really deeply think about that and shape that for themselves. And I can imagine that even just that process and thinking about how they were going to structure this material has given them a lot of insight into who they are and what their strengths are that they'll be communicating to people going forward as well. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And you know, that, that brings up, I had a a student, this was a few, this may have been during the pandemic. I think it was during, during the pandemic in the thick of it. Um, I had a student, she was in the Pacific Northwest and she and she made a good argument. She, you know, she wanted to do this internship, but it was a, she was a cook. Mm. And I'm like, you're a cook. And she's like, yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a professional cook. 
Um, but uh, what I'm going to be doing, and she was a political si- online political science major. Yeah. And she said, but what I'm going to be doing is, you know, with um, with some of the federal funds that were coming to her community, mm-hmm. right? And outreach, working with unsheltered individuals, people that were trying to get back on their feet, and they mm-hmm. gave her um, some money, and she hooked up with an organization, and she was cooking um, and serving. Uh, these individuals uh, like five days a week Mm -hmm. and then she would have to kind of like you know she would she would also be in charge of kind of uh, you know with the budget and and keeping up with the budget and buying so she was like doing everything it was like a one-woman operation yeah and she made it like amazing like I couldn't I mean every time I would read her her work and then when I saw her portfolio I need to find out I need to remember who her name was it was like was unbelievable what what she was doing and what she was showcasing so she would showcase you know the food it looked amazing yeah and then kind of where they were set up um and it was just again something unique I couldn't tell her I couldn't give her boxes that she had to kind of go yeah. into like these are the co- no she she created yeah. her own and it was yeah. really an amazing experience and it was really great to read oh I love hearing that yeah. Well, maybe we can try to track her down, talk to her. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> she sounds like an extraordinarily, extraordinary human being yeah. as well. Um, but yeah, it's an important conversation. And it's something that, I, you know, I'm kind of interested to see as, you know, higher education continues to evolve, how many more opportunities there might be for students that are, um you know, kind of figuring out who they are and, you know, where they are now, where they want to go, what skills they want to gain. And then I think those kind of happy moments where this growth happens in an unexpected way and allowing that to kind of get the same level of recognition, maybe that some of these predetermined kinds of outcomes or, or competencies may receive. So I think that they might actually be really telling for the institutions as well. You know, we've got all of these students that are saying that they're main competencies in appropriations, for example, or advocacy. And right now it's not something that's really being highlighted and celebrated and part of our institutional language or or framework. So um, I am kind of excited to see, you know, as students get their voices about, you know, what, what they want from higher education heard, how that might also evolve. And, I, you know, I love talking to faculty members like yourselves that are really providing space for students to really think about that and, and recognize it in themselves and value it and have that opportunity to, to share it with other people. Um, so I know we're coming near the end of our mm-hmm. conversation today. Um, But as I mentioned, I'm really fascinated in the kinds of um, research work that you're doing and other courses that you're teaching. Would you mind sharing just for a few minutes the kind of research that you're doing currently? I don't know if you have any upcoming publications. I don't want any spoilers, but um, I would love to hear what kind of research that you're you're doing now, too. Yeah, well. Thank you. Um, you know, it's it's funny. We're just right now, just literally yesterday, and then today I have to go back and 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 do some edits. We're we're submitting proposals to our lab. We do have a lab, um, an experimental lab within our school. It's run by a, my colleague, Professor Kim Fridkin, um, mm-hmm. where um, myself and a couple colleagues, this early start program that 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 I direct. Um, it's for incoming first year students. We we try to um, get students that might be based on uh, various metrics. Um, they might be considered underprepared for college. Yeah. We ask a whole bunch of them to start to start start university early, and we kind of do a boot camp type uh, with academics. We're with them all day. We introduce them to other faculty. We take a field trip to the Capitol. We take a field trip to the Maricopa County elect, uh, Election right. Center. We um, get uh, alumni, get alumni to come and talk to these students. It's a fantastic program. I did some research on it almost 10 years ago. 
Um, and we found that it, it did it did matter. You know, these students did kind of rise to the level of their of their peers, which is where we wanted them. We didn't want them yeah. to be behind. Um, and then it also increased retention, which the Excellent. college and university was very, very happy about. Yes. Yes. So we it's been a, a, a while since we've done more research. So we're going to submit a proposal to, um, to to do it again to this time we want to compare, and this is a grad student kind of taking the lead on this, which is amazing. Um, she wants to kind of compare it to uh, to kind of students that fit the same, you know, kind of have the same, um, I don't know how I want to say this, kind of the same uh, uh criteria, but mm-hmm. they chose not to be a part of the early start program mm-hmm. and to compare kind of outcomes with those yeah. students versus the early starters. Yeah. Yeah. So she wants to focus on that. Um, and I, since I've done the research before, I'm kind of helping her with that as well as another faculty member, very excited. Her name's Kanisha Wright. She's doing amazing things uh, research wise. Um, so she's kind of on it as well because she's helping with the program this year. So no submitting problem. that, and then um, I actually have a grad or an undergraduate student who's submitting a proposal for her honors thesis, and I am not. This is not my research; it's hers. But um, kind of looking at the um, implications of negative comments on female candidates' Instagram mm. posts. Yeah. So um, that's something that that where she's going to examine and I'm going to kind of be her director. Nice. So that's really what I'm looking at right now in terms of, of research, kind of taking a little step back and letting others rise and, um, mm-hmm. and take the lead, which mm-hmm. is really exciting. Um, and that's really what, I, what I'm doing. I, you know, I'm, okay. I think I have a, I talk to reporters all the time about politics you know, what's going on in Arizona and women in politics, because we've had a a long history of women in politics here in Arizona. Mm -hmm. Um, So I enjoy doing that. And I haven't done hard, hard research on women in politics in a while. I'm more like looking at data and then looking at the current situation, what's going on right now and, and talking to various reporters and maybe writing up little articles for popular, you know, not, not the academic world, but for popular media. Yeah. And so that's something that I, I do enjoy doing right now. Oh, that sounds so fun. Yeah. yeah. And I, I hope you'll let me know when those um, research publications come out with these yeah. things that you're working with. They sound fascinating and yeah. very relevant and important yes. work. <laughs> yeah, I, I think so. It's exciting. Um You know, we'll see. I think evaluating this program, early start, it's important. I mean, it's all it's all amazing donors that that support the program. And so they have a right to know if it's effective. Right. So we we, we need to test this and 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 let them know. I I would I'm expecting it to, to still be effective and to be helpful and to increase retention, which is what we want. But, yeah. you know, we don't know. We need to, we need to test yeah. it and see. Good to do. Yeah. Good to do the yeah. research. Well, thank you again so much, Gina, for You're joining welcome. me today. It was lovely talking to you. I know our listeners will enjoy the conversation as well. And yeah. we will talk to you again soon. Yeah. Sounds great. Thank you so much for having me. And it was really great to meet you. Thank you. This concludes our conversation. To hear our next episode, be sure to subscribe to Digication Scholars Conversations on YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. The Digication Scholars Conversations series is brought to you by Digication, a technology platform powering the most innovative e-portfolio programs in K-12 and higher education. Our website can be found at digication.com. If you enjoyed today's conversation, please like, subscribe, and share with a friend. Thanks for tuning in.